You're listening to the Futures Podcast, live from Space 4, a haven for digital cooperation, physically located just a stone's throw from Finsbury Park Station in London. In this show, we meet the scientists, technologists, artists, and philosophers working to imagine the sorts of developments that might dramatically alter what it means to be human. Some of their predictions will be preferable, others might seem impossible, but none of them are inevitable. My name is Luke Robert Mason, and I am your host for this evening. The internet is invisible. In our always online lives, we rarely consider the infrastructure that makes it possible to surf the web. It's all too easy to forget the vast assemblage of components, cables, corporations, and capital that are required to shape our digital experiences. It's only when something breaks within the vast internet network that we suddenly are exposed to the material reality of the hardware and the software that makes modernity possible. But could this invisibility be by design? Does it serve in obscuring the myriad of ethically dubious externalized costs? Take, for example, artificial intelligence. We're being told how this seemingly disembodied technology will have a profound impact on humanity, whether that takes the form of a as-yet-to-be-realized benefit or massive existential risk is still up for debate, but the rhetoric behind AI obscures a present and real-world impact. Generative AI requires a massive amount of power and water to run its server farms. By one estimation, data centers, cryptocurrencies, and AI account for almost 2% of global power around 2022, and this is set to double by 2026. Thankfully, there are those working to critique these aspects of internet infrastructure, including my guests today. Dr. Kareen Kath, a cultural anthropologist at the University of Delft, and Dr. Fika Janssen, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam and co-principal investigator of the Critical Infrastructure Lab. In their new book, Eaten by the Internet, an edited collection of essays from Meatspace, various contributors work to make visible infrastructural power. In doing so, they reveal how the constellation of internet infrastructure in the hands of the tech giants and state actors has a profound impact on society, politics, and the environment. Tonight, we will explore how uh, this can be contested and reshaped towards a more equitable and more sustainable ends. And on that note, please put your hands together and join me in welcoming Kareen Kath and Fika Janssen to the Futures Podcast. Both of you traveled from uh, Amsterdam uh, to, to be here today, so thank you for making that trip. And I, I want to start with the, with the title of the book, and uh, this idea of being eaten by the internet. Now, it's a provocative title, but could you tell us, Corinne, perhaps why the internet is all-consuming, and how does it gobble up society? Thanks so much for hosting us here tonight in the space and, and having this conversation about making the uh, invisible more visible. As to your question, uh, and the reason why we wrote the book is because when we tend to think of the internet, it's often in the way that we use it in our, our daily lives, so for communications. But what we see is that the internet is a technology of connectivity is expanding much beyond its initial wheelhouse. So for instance, if we think about societal critical institutions like healthcare, it increasingly requires internet connectivity. And there's a number of really good examples. For instance, when on the continent, they decided to do COVID tracking during the pandemic, some of the first players that 
were invited to the table or that joined the table, showed up at the table, were Google and Apple because they are the providers of most of our phones. Most of the operating systems or software that runs on that phone. So they were like, well, if you want to do something and you want to do it at a national scale, you're going to have to work with us because the way in which you reach your citizens or the people that live in your country is through these phones that we build. And there are many, many examples of the ways in which internet technologies are increasingly important in these kind of very specific sectors that don't necessarily have to do with communication. And another very current one is, um, for instance, the role of the internet in geopolitics and warfare. So what we see is that there are large parts of Ukraine where Russia has essentially shut down all of the local telecommunications companies, meaning that either if you want to text someone to see if they're okay, you can't do it. Or if you are in the Ukrainian army and you're trying to position yourself vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, you cannot until um, Starlink stepped in, which is part of SpaceX, Elon Musk's company, and said, we can provide you with internet connectivity via satellites. And so the reason that we try to think about the internet as, as expanding is because as soon as you move from being a simple communications tool or comparatively simple communications tool to being the backbone to all of these very critical parts of society, that requires us to ask some hard questions about how do we hold these companies to account? How do we make sure that governments don't abuse their hold over some of these infrastructures, et cetera, and hence the book. Fika, how do we make internet infrastructure visible and, and why is it so important to, I guess, expose this thing that we usually just don't think about? I think one thing is a myth that it's invisible because everybody, I don't know, is there anybody here who doesn't, who hasn't brought a mobile phone, for example, with them, which is a very physical element of our internet infrastructure. So we connect to it every day for multiple reasons. Uh, we have, I don't know how many routers probably in this building, which is also a very physical component of the internet. It's just like all of these CCTV cameras in the street, they become so normalized that we no longer see them. So actually there are a lot of physical elements. And I think it's also about retraining our, our brains and starting to see it and looking in the places we normally don't look at because uh, today we'll be talking a bit about the back end of the internet so the heart, sort of the more infrastructural layer which you can think of of data centers for example these are usually not located here in space four. <laughs> but for instance, when I look at the Netherlands, they're usually either located in, for instance, a place where there's a university campus or in sort of an industrial site where there's other warehouses too. And where it's very difficult to distinguish between what is actually a warehouse filled with hardware and racks that run the internet. And what is, for instance, a meatpacking uh, this industry. Maybe the one has more trucks going in and out and more people going in and out because the data center usually has very little staff going in and out. So so I think there are a lot of physical components, but we just, we, we have, become, this have become so normalized that we don't look for them, uh, that we don't see it. Well, you mentioned that we don't look for them. It feels like they've become normalized and we've got to train our brain to see it. So what are some of those methods? What are some of those tools that we can use to, I guess, do critical approaches to infrastructure? Well, one is uh, with the Critical Infrastructure Lab, we've done data center walks. So you can do an excursion outside and go and look for physical elements that represent the internet. You can look for it for cameras, things like this. There's usually guides. Ingrid Burton wrote a guide, Networks of New York. So it just shows sort of that there's artifacts that you can look at. You can also find semi-public data centers because the commercial data centers you cannot actually enter. Uh, it's very uh, high security. Sometimes you even fail to recognize that they're data centers. So yesterday somebody was talking to me that one of the huge clusters, the biggest clusters of data centers in the Netherlands is next to the airport, Schiphol, and there's armed guards protecting it, which in my mind is just crazy. But you wouldn't notice it because you would probably just think it's part of the airport and it is probably just like the border patrol uh, protracting those perimeters. So I think one is sort of going on excursions and seeing them and two also maybe uh, talking to people and, and going to places like this where people are discussing sort of these internet infrastructures. And Karina, I wonder if there are other ways to map 
these infrastructures? I think there's a there's a growing group of both activists and academics that are are doing really important work here. And something that has been useful to the research that Fika and I have done and that I've seen used really well by others as well is something as simple as <laughs> if you go on Google Maps, you can look at data centers. And if you look at the type of cooling they have on the outside, or if you look at the size that they are, you can usually make some estimation of what they're used for, for instance. And similarly, I have a good friend who works at Amnesty International, Matt Mahmoudi, and he's done this um, beautiful report on the use of facial recognition to control the movements of uh, Palestinians in the OPT. And I think one of the methods that they use was really innovative, where they did desk research and a lot of what we call OSINT or open source intelligence. So looking at things like Google Maps, but also looking at uh, social media and Twitter and other places where you could get a sense of what does this infrastructure look like before you're actually on site. And then combining that with um, talking to people who either experience that kind of surveillance by means of technology or who worked in the army and now have a different view on what it means to have done that. And then subsequently go to the field and experience it yourself to get a good sense, a good holistic sense from all of the sides of what the infrastructure looks like physically, materially, but also how it manifests in a particular social reality and what that means for the lived experience of, of people under such technologies. I wonder if we could take a moment to map the problem space. So uh, why is it so important to look at infrastructure? Like, What are the different things that are at play, whether it's environmental, power, capitalism? What does that, what is that, I mean, that's everything, but what does that map of infrastructure look like? One of the big things in, in this follows from the answer that I gave to your question of how is the internet eating the world is the fact that its infrastructure, which for us is um, anything from cell antennas to cloud computing um, to deep sea cables, um, but also the more digital parts of it. So software standards that make uh, networks connect to each other. If we are using that as a digital backbone to our societies, which is a little bit the premise that I'm working with and the belief of many people who've, who've contributed chapters to Eaten by the Internet, then subsequently the problem space, I mean, you were talking about the problem space is everything, right? Because this is the digital backbone to our societies in many ways that we have electricity grids or water systems or all of these other things. And we think through how building those has an impact on who has access to water or what places in a country have good electricity connections versus which don't. And so this question of how do you map the problem space is almost the inverse. Every problem space that we map from healthcare to education to economic production to et cetera will now inherently have a digital component, will now inherently raise questions of connectivity that are not necessarily questions of communication. What the book does so well is it reveals all of those issues that infrastructure currently has. And yet the, the ambition still seems to be to, to grow that infrastructure, con to continue the perpetual growth of these technologies and, and the expansion of these technologies. Uh, do you think at the core of this is, is really a critique of a growth mentality and how we think about and how we design technology? Uh, yes. And I think... Um so I'll take it a step back and go to your previous question, because one of the uh, things that I'm working on is also to understand uh, the environmental impact of internet infrastructure and also understand sort of how, and that is part of the, the answer to the second question, how tech is seen as both by industry and policymakers as the solution to many of our contemporary crises. Mm -hmm. So if we look, for instance, at data centers, there's been a lot of uh, recently more conflict happening in Europe around them, because, for instance, there's an estimate estimation that in Ireland uh, there's a cluster of data centers too that is not surprisingly because sort of there's uh, sea cable arrives in Ireland there's also favorable tax or political climate for uh, tech companies to be there and this cluster of uh, data centers is seen to in the near future gobble up 15% of all the national energy of the grid mm -hmm. which is a huge amount but not only electricity 
The other thing is also that uh, it consumes quite a lot of water for cooling, depending on how these data centers are being cooled, because they produce a lot of heat, but they need a very stable climate. And in a very hot summer, I think uh, last year, the year before, here actually data centers uh, were prioritized in the water capacity over, for instance, agriculture, which to my mind is just insane because we're like dependent for our food on this. But <laughs> would it really be so bad if we shut down some of these servers? Then if we can't grow the food that we eat. So I think these are really questions we're not asking, but because several political reasons and contracts they have with utility companies, these sort of sectors get prioritized over other sectors. And just to show sort of the quantification of things like uh, Meta, so the parent company of Facebook, was going to build a new data center in the Netherlands to hold the metaverse, uh, whatever that might mean. And it was going to consume the same amount of energy as the entire city of Amsterdam. And the question is, do we really want to prior allocate that amount of energy to running the metaverse over, for instance, an entire city? Uh, and I think these are questions we're not asking in the, in the public domain. And that comes to the problem of growth, where everything with computing is always done in infinite, as if we have infinite amount of resources, infinite amount of space, infinite amount of computing. So that's both the mentality, because if we look at the internet, the mentality is the always on mentality. We need to keep the internet we always on. We need to keep these servers always running. Um, so that's on the one hand sort of a, a ingrained in this industry perspective. And from the political side, we see that uh, we have huge hopes in technology to save us from all the impending crises as sort of like uh, quick and easy fixes in the future so that we don't have to change sort of our economic or social behavior in the present. Hmm. Well, if you've been to certain parts of Amsterdam, it does feel like the metaverse, so I can understand why it's going to take as much energy. Although the idea of starving versus accessing TikTok, I mean, I know what, I know what I'm going to pick there. But you mentioned briefly at the end the idea that there are technological fixes to technological problems. But as the book reveals, this idea of green tech and, and green capitalism, uh, often that's really just an oxymoron, isn't it? Yes. I mean, there's a great book that's called The Value of a Whale and uh, from Adriana Bühler. And she uh, starts with this analogy of a whale, that a whale was never really important until we realized, so we were hunting it, killing it, all of this thing, until we realized how much carbon it sucks out of the air. And now all of a sudden we've put like a lot of money into preserving whales because it allows us to sort of then create an offset market, so the carbon market in which we then trade carbon credits so that we can continue business as usual. And I think in her book, she makes this great point about how green capitalism is just a farce. It's just a new form of extraction. It's a new form of an economy in which we're actually not, we're still treating nature as an economic commodity to be used for profit. And I think this is exactly why green capitalism is an oxymoron or uh, <laughs> green tech is an oxymoron. Technology is inherently polluting and we have to stop treating it like it's not. We also have to stop treating it like it will solve all these amazing, uh, solve all these very wicked problems. Like uh, if you talk to people, for instance, <laughs> in different types of spaces, in policy spaces, uh, and we talk about uh, uh, artificial intelligence, they oftentimes say, oh, we all know AI is going to save us. And it's like, okay, well, great. Uh, <laughs> just give me one problem. Go from the general to the specific, you know? So just give me one, give me one solution. And they, they then to start talk about climate change, for example. And uh, one of an, an example that's brought to the table often is that uh, if we actually start using AI in agriculture, we can more efficiently spread pesticides. Yeah. <laughs> This is, of course, very problematic because this is actually not the future I want. Maybe we should, <laughs> <laughs> maybe we should revolutionize the agriculture policies rather than implementing tech on this. So, a, we're foreclosing futures that actually might be very helpful in favor of investing in artificial intelligence. But the other worst nightmare is just imagine that Google and Monsanto team up. It's like. <laughs> That opens up a whole Deere. new problem space. <laughs> so I think this is uh, an example also why green tech just doesn't work. Well, you've you got to love uh, tech boy logic right there. Um, but Corinne, what about efficiency? Again, another response to 
what Vicar has just said is, well, why don't we just drive towards greater efficiency? Maybe AI can work out the problem of why these servers are taking so much power. And in some cases, there's been press releases that have claimed that that's what's going to happen. What about efficiency? Um, it's, what about it? Um, it's an interesting one and sort of dovetailing off of what Fika said, I think the first question maybe is efficiency for whom, mm -hmm. right? Because the example that you mentioned in terms of agriculture and precision fertilizing the ground, I think is a really interesting one because you mentioned Google and Monsanto and I'd like to add John Deere to that. Mm -hmm. John Deere, obviously well known for, for building large equipment for agriculture, are now also increasingly known for selling uh, selling these tractors that have software in them. And on the basis of the way in which farmers use these tractors, Monsanto and, and the software that they run gather a lot of data. However, that data does not go to the farmers. It's not for them to be accessed. It belongs to the person with the hardware, in this case, the, uh, the tractor and the software. Uh, and so the question is, now this big US-based agricultural company has all of this data about, for instance, how farmers here could be more efficient, right? And what efficient means is what they decide for it to mean. And that that is not how these kind of decisions can or should be made. And the other thing on top of that is, and, and I love bringing in an example from the world that I know well, which is cloud computing, which is where much of my current research is focused. Cloud computing companies love to tell how putting all of your data and all of your computing needs in the cloud is more efficient. Now, when you actually look at what it costs to move from doing things in your own basement on your own computers to the cloud over a five year period, what you see is that it's only a very small subset of use cases for which that becomes efficient in the sense that it saves you in costs, right? Because that's obviously usually what they're aiming at or that it's efficient as in that their computing uh, abilities are faster and better than what you could run at home because of the limitations that you inevitably have when you run everything yourself. And what you see is that use case is mostly for tech startups who know that they need to be able to grow fast and dynamically, who know that they will probably have a small group of users, a small group, and then suddenly have a search, mm -hmm. and that they need to be able to accommodate for that. Now, that's very hard if you're a startup and you need to run your own computers, and like right now you need you know just a rack of servers, and tomorrow you need 10,000. That's just not feasible. And then it becomes interesting to say, oh, we punt everything over to the cloud because they can do that. They can do that scaling up within a second. It takes them nothing. And the bill goes up, but you have that efficiency and, and that ability in that sense. If you are a government and you know that your timeline is not one of five years in which you go from being a startup to your IPO and you sell out and you go live on your island in Barbados, but you have a steady set of computing needs that grows maybe incrementally depending on whether your population you know, expands or decreases, then actually you can plan quite well for your computing needs because you can project them. And then all of a sudden, this notion of the cloud is more efficient because it has all of these fancy AI bells and whistles or because it's cheaper. It just doesn't hold. And one of the things that I've noticed is like we need to push back on the rhetoric of, in this case, cloud computing companies, but in, in many cases, because it's an easy sell to make. And at the moment that you realize that, oh, we're five years in and now our bill's astronomical, it's too late because you're very deep in their system and it's very hard to undo that. So when they say efficiency, what they're really talking about is cost efficiency rather than energy efficiency. Both. I mean, it's cost efficiency. It's the capacity of their systems because obviously, you know, what I could provide you on my SAD server in the basement is never going to be what Microsoft or Google or AWS can, can offer you. So efficiency takes many different forms. They definitely promise on energy efficiency, but that is also a function of their skill. Because they are so large, they can make really good agreements with energy providers. And so is that truly efficient or are you using your market power in a not so much a carrot, but a stick kind of way? Um, so again, like efficiency for whom, efficiency at which costs? I think these are all the questions that we need to be asking when people say, oh, but it's much more efficient.
I would like to add, I think people who are listening or in the room here from more the environmental background, they probably have heard of it, but you have the Javox paradox and the rebound effect. And sort of if we look at the industrial revolutions that uh, we have gone through, it's not that if we make things more efficient, we will produce or consume less. On the contrary, we usually produce and consume more. It might mean that we can make a single data center more efficient or a single computational process more efficient. But on the overall, we usually do them more computation, more uh, production and more consumption. And so this efficiency gain, it sounds always nice because it's per item maybe that it becomes more energy efficient or cheaper. But on the sum, usually it means we just consume and produce more. But Fika, are sad servers in basements, are they more sustainable? <laughs> I think it's a, a, a weighing of sort of different values that we have. So uh, if we're looking at sort of the trend in internet infrastructure and especially in cloud computing these days, it's market first, then maybe consumers and then the planet. And we see a huge centralization of power and money in the hands of a few very large companies who are also running hyperscalers. Would sort of on this one individual sort of process, a data center in a basement be more energy efficient? Probably not, mm. but running everything now in hyperscalers of large uh, tech companies, it also produces a lot of additional services. So all this computation or AI, generative AI, chat GPT would never have been possible if we didn't put all this data in the hands of these big tech companies. So maybe these single computational processes are less energy efficient in the moms and pops basements. But on the overall, I think moving everything into a centralized uh, place actually creates sort of a, a market for a lot of other tools that consume a lot of energy. But, but then how is it possible to create these things called sustainable infrastructures? How do we move towards a system that engages with solidarity, reduction limits and, and redistribution? Um, wh where do we start moving towards that? Well, we need to make we need to make changes. <laughs> uh, I think one of the major changes that we need to make is that we have to see this as an industry. Because oftentimes we're still stuck in this thing where we see it as sort of our relationship to tech with the consumption. We're watching videos, we're storing something on the cloud. It's an individual making a choices. But actually this is a multi-billion dollar industry and we should treat it as such. And we should also hold our politicians and policymakers to account and push them to not fall into the Silicon, like drink the Silicon Valley Kool-Aid. Because actually there are different things and different values that we want to promote. And I think here it's very important. So on the state side, it's very important to see that we all, that if we look at, for instance, the mainland in Europe, we always look at Brussels for regulation. So we say, oh, they're a regulatory framework. They create an AI act. They did the GDPR or the data protection uh, law. But they, like any other states, they also wield a huge investment power and soft power. So they sit at the table with these tech companies. That's one. But also we invest millions of dollars in it. And I think uh, Masukatu said it best that we have an entrepreneurial state. None of this technology that we hold in our hands that we use could have been possible if we didn't invest the public resources in it. We, we, our states are the early investors in all of this technology. And so we shouldn't see them as regulators. We should actually demand that they invest in something else. And here I think it becomes tricky because we find it very difficult to create mental models of how things can be different. If we say degrowth, everybody comes like, mm, I don't want to do less. Why do I do less? But I think one of the things is that we should really question certain things. If we're building these data centers, shouldn't we also exercise power over what they're used for, what these computational processes are used for? Do we really want our territories, our natural resources to be used for a metaverse? Or do we say we think these places need a more public uh, interest good? Like, should there be computational processes for medical data, for example? And I think when you start asking these questions, people start thinking about these infrastructures in a different way. But also, I would like to see some radical politics happening where we invest in, for instance, uh, decomposable infrastructures. Just to get this imagination about infrastructures don't have to be permanent and if we stop treating them as permanent, we can start also seeing it as choices that we make, maybe not every day, but every year or every five years on what we find important, which values do we center? Because at the moment we just see it as static objects and the values that are centered are profit and capital. It's not any of our interest, it's profit and capital in this way. I love this idea of uh, 
decomposable infrastructure. It just sounds like a tree. It's uh, my, mycelium <laughs> and forests. So you've got, you've got that on one end and you've got server racks on the other. But if industry has a responsibility, Corinne, does the individual themselves also have some degree of responsibility for how we engage with digital platforms and just engage with infrastructure in general? Is there something we can do? There's always something we can do. And but the skill at which we are comparing things here is is a little bit disjointed in a sense that, you know, we all know it's good if we don't use straws or if we fly less or uh, if we don't eat meat and and these are all things where, you know, I feel comfortable saying at least to me, it feels good to, to take. I mean, we took the train here. We didn't fly in from Amsterdam. These are all choices that we make because we don't want to be so jaded as to say, well, as long as they don't regulate all of big industry, whatever I do doesn't matter. That's also not, I have, I have kids. That's not the example that I want to set. Is that the way we're going to undo some of the harms that arise from this? No, by no means. I mean, much as I think in general, it's very healthy for everyone maybe to be not spending so much time on TikTok. Also, that is not how you're going to solve this issue because the problem is not, I mean, the problem in part isn't our uh, human consumption of content on the internet. But as I mentioned before, parts of the use of the internet that are polluting are industrial. And again, like I mentioned the example of the use of Starlink in geopolitics, in, in the way that connectivity features in healthcare, um, but there are many other examples. For instance, the port of Rotterdam works really closely with a number of connectivity providers that have essentially meant that a lot of the way in which the port is run, they're trying to automate it. Now, that is an endeavor that takes a lot of computational power. And that is an endeavor that will have a huge impact. So the question that we also need to be asking ourselves is why are we applying all of this technology to how we run our societies and is that always necessary? Another great example is the Dutch government is very enthusiastically punting over all of their computing needs to Microsoft. Um, and it's not like we've not been doing this for many years when we have a good digital government our online services work incredibly well so the question then becomes like should we be giving that to microsoft and and i want to sort of draw that back to the conversation we had earlier in terms of efficiency and, and whether it's better to have some of this stuff run you know on the sad server in the basement or with a mom and pop cloud computing company and without like sort of litigating the the details of efficiency, I do want to highlight, and, and this is something that came up in the interviews that I did, uh, that I'm doing for my research as well. Cloud computing companies have a really perverse incentive to switch on all of the lights. Mm. So when you use a cloud, you essentially get metered by usage. So, and, and I've heard people complain about this quite often is that, you know, you sign these contracts, you offload all of your computing needs and all of your data to the cloud, and then you get these monthly bills and they go up and up and up and up because, oh, someone switched on this fancy AI feature that they had and now they've decided to double the price for it. And then someone said, oh, maybe we should give this whatever gimmicky thing a try. So you literally are working with someone that has an incentive to leave all of the lights in the house on because that's how they get paid. And it's all of these things that I think we also need to be incredibly mindful of when we when we think about solutions or sustainable technologies. What are the incentives that exist in this industry? And what does that mean when you're trying to weigh, oh, what do I do with these computational needs that I have? And which ones maybe don't need to be computational? It's wonderful that both of you took the train, but I can almost bet <laughs> that there's some kids somewhere who's just trained an LLM and you might as well have flown on the amount of carbon that it took him to train that large language model. But then if it's not these soft interventions, what about policy? Are there ways that we can encourage or even enforce greener policies perhaps? Well, I just also still want to add something to what Corinne was saying, because I think if we look at sort of the digital rights movement, who's been protecting our rights online for a long time, it's a relative nascent movement in comparison to others, for example. And I think now that the internet is starting to eat society, it's really important to also start learning from other movements who've been fighting sort of industries like the fossil fuel industry already for a long time and see what tactics actually work when you start seeing something as an industry rather than a consumer product. 
And I think here, for instance, what I find very interesting is like with Extinction Rebellion at the moment, they have been blocking highways to stop fossil fuel subsidies in the Netherlands. And if you see the amount of money that goes from the state to fossil fuel companies, that is actually where you can make a difference rather than <laughs> saying, no, you should delete your pictures from your iPhone or your Android because that's the way you save space. Because in the end, it's an industry and there's a lot of business to business. And I think these sort of things work quite well. And other examples, for instance, the divestment movement, stop investing in fossil fuel companies. We should also stop investing in tech companies in a certain way. I'm not saying every company, we are investing in renewable energy. And similarly, I think we should start pushing for large funds, for instance, pension funds, European pension funds, to have a vision on what do we invest in. And I think this is where you start pinpointing to a little bit more systemic change. I think the problem with uh, policy is where I would love a very radical policy on sort of uh, just and sustainable infrastructures is that at the moment we do live in societies where we, we couple sort of internet infrastructures and the digital economy to the well-being of our countries. And so there's a lot of push from politicians as well to get a lot of these big tech players to put infrastructure in the country. So I think it was estimated that, because uh, the numbers are very murky too, so we don't know how many exactly, but if you look at U the UK, the Netherlands, Germany and France, there are about 1,500 data centers around. And we're actively lobbying Silicon Valley to, to build more because we want to maintain our strategic advantage over this new economy and I think here it's really about also demystifying and engaging in conversations and saying okay if this is gonna be amazing for our societies whether it's socially or environmentally like we really have to demystify some of these things maybe it can contribute to something but it has an environmental cost the social cost of uh, social media platforms have all been all over the news maybe we can be a little bit more critical and we can also demand our politicians to be more critical Corinne, there does seem like there's this schizophrenic approach when it comes to policy, because on one end, people are warned of the dangers of AI and then also put their hand out to get $7 trillion worth of servers to build that AI. And I know there's examples of that in Europe as well, isn't there? Yeah, um, policy for me as an anthropologist is just, it's the gift that keeps on giving um, because it's it's such a beautiful way to see the contradictions that live within institutions that live within different political systems and i think there are a lot of both great examples that show us the limitations of policy at least when it comes to europe and i mean we must take that with in the context of the reality that the industry that we're trying to tackle is heavily American or, or some of the behemoths are tend to be US-based companies where the regulatory and financial markets have always been very different than here, right? They had access to a lot of money. The risks that companies are allowed to take there are much higher than what we consider to be reasonable within, within Europe. So they have this immense head start. In addition to having uh, what Shura Nas of privacy company calls a a uh, 15 year regulatory holiday, right? Where we've spent some time here trying to figure out, oh, how do we regulate this? So they have this immense head start and that is the reality that we're up against. And then at the same time, the EU loves to, or especially the commission loves to say things along the lines of, well, you know, this is a place where technology gets regulated. And they say these kind of things in the context of, of, of big regulations like the GDPR or the EU AI Act. And the EU AI Act is beautiful mm -hmm. um, because it shows this tension and this contradiction that exists in Europe so incredibly well. So when, you know, when this was first introduced, I mean, obviously there was a bit of, you know, protectionism behind it and a bit of, we know that these systems are going to be primarily made by US companies. They're now going to be uh, entering our markets and we need them to meet certain safety standards. Even the choice for safety is, is a particular focus that we can talk about. But leaving that aside for now, they were all about it. Uh, France and Germany also leading some of, of the work behind it. And then all of a sudden, over the last 12 to nine months, both France and Germany have developed or have now have their own national champions in this space or have their own AI companies, Aleph, Alpha, and Mistral. Mistral is from France. And at the very end of the policy negotiations around the EU AI Act, so so imagine you know you're getting married and you're at the aisle and someone goes no 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 hold up 
we're going to go back to our uh, prenup negotiation because actually when we started drafting the EU AI Act, we, have, we had always done it with companies from abroad in mind. But now, if we put in place all of these restrictions, it's going to also affect the companies that have suddenly sprung up for us that we kind of do sort of kind of need because we also do want to, you know, not see this train leave the station without us. Mixing metaphors here. But, and, and I think that example, and in the end it passed, but it, it was tricky. There, there was a while there where it wasn't clear if it was going to. And we see the same thing with cloud computing. So on the one hand, um, you know, the European Union has very clear sustainable development goals. And on the other hand, they're pouring billions into setting up what they call the telco and the cloud industry. Quite unclear what this is, or the, the sorry, the cloud and the edge industry. And it's 1.2 or 1.4 billion, which sounds like a very nice amount of money. <laughs> but keep in mind that casually, AWS dropped 5 billion into Mexico just last week to build out their infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. So even in the space where we're trying to compete, it's a drop in the bucket. It's very hard. So the thing that I'm really interested in is what is a third way? What is the third way in which you say, yes, we need the regulation. Also, we need to not be squandering public money in a race that we are bound to lose. And what does that look like? It was interesting you said bound to lose that race. I mean, that is some of the justification. If we don't do it, someone else will. Is that a mentality that we just need to get over? Or do we need everybody on? But like, how, how do we deal with the, the very fact that they know that competition is the only driving metric as it currently stands? Well, I think we already lost the race, yeah. if there was a race to begin <laughs> with. I think it's also about being realistic where we stand. And actually, we have given the race away by not enforcing existing regulation that you and I are all bound to. Because also all of these companies could have paid taxes, you know, the last 20 years, and they would have never gotten this big. So it's like, on the one hand, we're pouring huge amounts of public money into sort of a race that doesn't exist. Whereas actually this race would never have been there if we just enforced existing regulations. So I think we also have to call sort of a, an apple, an apple, and a pear, a pear. I know this is not the right metaphor. But, an apple, uh, an apple, and a Google, a Google is where yeah, you're really... Yeah. But uh, uh, we are in sort of a policy landscape where states are always pretending that they're powerless against all of these big multinational corporations. But in the end, <laughs> they are there because we A, allow them on our territories, but B, we have also allowed them to grow because of favorable tax regulation, because of, uh, if we look, for instance, one of the conflicts around this uh, metadata center in the Netherlands was not only that uh, they were going to come and there was like a land issue and a water and energy issue, but they were going to get preferential treatment and a preferential hookup to the grid over other industries that couldn't get hooked up because there's a, apparently a queue in the Netherlands. And they got it because the minister called the utility company to say hook up Facebook over everybody else that is waiting. So it's like enforce existing regulation and don't give them preferential treatment. And maybe there would not have been a race to begin with. And I think this is actually where we have to be more critical of all the things our politicians are telling us because yes, if we believe the Kool-Aid, if we had all drank it, life would be great, but this is not reality. So in that case, how can we respond? Is, is there a role for internet activism, for example? I mean, definitely. And something that has been really interesting to see as someone who, who actually comes from that background um, originally and then moved or transitioned into academia and is still very reluctantly there, I guess is the, the best way to describe it. Anybody who ends up in academia is reluctantly there. <laughs> Someone who's currently in that's, academia. That, that, no, that's very fair. Some people are more open about it than others. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I no longer hide this. What I've seen over the last decade or so is that there was a real siloing in, in activism, right? There was a, a sense of, oh, I am a digital rights activist and hence I work on issues of privacy or freedom of expression or freedom of speech, et cetera. And I don't care so much about environmentalism or I don't care or I don't see necessarily options for working on anti-discrimination. Um, and that is really changing. And again, that's in part because of the fact that the internet is increasingly 
everywhere that all of all of the issues that we care about have have that component and it's also because there have been a, a lot of folks um especially uh sarah chandler at, at edry nani jansen many others who really made the effort of saying no 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 these silos need to be broken down because how this technology functions is a critical part of the problems that we see for instance when we're trying to do um, anti-discrimination work or when we're trying to work on migration rights or when we're trying to work on environmentalism um, so in that sense like i wouldn't speak so much mo anymore about internet activism as such but much more um, look at the different ways in which activists across the spectrum have gotten incredibly smart and good at incorporating what the digital or what connectivity or what internet raises for new kinds of harms and new kinds of problems and putting those on the radar. So where where are the glimmers of hope? Where do we see <laughs> well, where do we see good examples of perhaps uh, alternative models or more sustainable ways of doing things, alternative approaches perhaps that are driving towards this more equitable infrastructural future? I think like there's in there's always different pockets of amazing people working and I think it's about sort of uh, finding them and I think together we're stronger. So I know in the in the UK I've been told there's a lot of energy collectives. There should be similarly internet collectives. There are already internet collectives, but join them, support them. They cannot do it on their own. Politicize our technology because it has a tendency to be depoliticized. So uh, be that very annoying person <laughs> that when your university or your company is like, we're going to the cloud, we're going to go to AWS or we're going to Microsoft Teams, be that annoying person and say, but why? No, but really, why? And really, is it going to save that much money? And just because I do think that continuously asking these questions requires the people to respond. And I think for far too long, we haven't needed to respond why we move certain uh, things to very commercial platforms that we used to run ourselves. Or universities used to run the infrastructure themselves, they are all now on Microsoft Teams. <laughs> and, and I think uh, here, it's not to this Microsoft, but it is like, why were these choices made? And why did nobody stand up and be like, wait, hold on a minute, because it looks better on the financial spreadsheet or uh, whatever the reason is. Uh, so I think it's about politicizing this. And you see also within the tech companies and within these internet governance uh, fora, you see people start uh, standing up. So you have uh, climate action tech, for instance. These are people who work in the tech industry, care about the environment. You have no tech for tyrants. These are people working in the tech industry that refuse refuse to have their products being sold to Frontex or to the American ICE that uh, deport uh, migrants. I think uh, it's also very important to support these types of movements and these types of collectives because in the end, this is where the glimmers of hopes are. And Corinne, where have you seen interventions that, that represent a hopeful future for what you've been talking about? So these, these interventions happen at different scales. And I think the level at which they happen also says something about their ability to upturn the larger powers that we're contending with, as uh, Professor Seda Gursis, who I work for, likes to say. Um, there's a beautiful chapter in the book by uh, Britt Paris, who is a professor at Rutgers University, and she really looks at uh, a number of rural areas in the US that have done really well at setting up their own internet co-ops and have done so uh, for communities that otherwise would not be connected in a way that's affordable to them. Now, obviously, no one, myself included, would ever make the argument that that is um, scalable or that that is an answer necessarily to the dominance of some of these companies, much as I would like for it to be, but that's not realistic. And so some of the other glimmers of hope that I see is that there are a lot of very smart policy folks and regulators who are looking, for instance, to see if anti-competition law can do anything around consolidation. Because the tricky bit, and we haven't really even touched on that here, but the tricky bit about the reality is that it's the three, four, maybe five same companies that are incredibly dominant in all of these different bits, no pun intended, of the internet. Um, deep sea cables are now often run by Google or Meta, operating software, mostly Google and Apple. Hardware, again, mostly Google or Apple. So there, there's all of these questions there as to 
what can we do about that? Now, I think there's many ways in which anti-competition law will inevitably come up short because it is about creating more, right? It is about having more competition, more companies, and then you run into these these questions of the environmental bounds that you want to stay within. But this is an incredibly hard problem and the powers that you know we're collectively contending with are huge. And so what I also hope is that, I mean, I know that there are people here in the room who are, who are working on these questions, um, but I do agree with Fika that, you know, an individual effort, unfortunately, won't be some sort of panacea and we need movements and collectives. And honestly, I mean, this is a bit of a, uh, a dark note, <laughs> I guess. Um, but now that we're here anyways, people have asked me you know, what is the solution for all of the problems that you sketch with the cloud? And how do we make sure that data centers are stopped in their environmental impact? And, you know, the best idea that I can come up with is, well, everyone is so incredibly worried about the existential risk of AI mm -hmm. instead of the existential risk of environmentalism that they don't realize that if we don't stop climate change, in 30 years, all of their data centers will be underwater. And so our AI overlords are not our problem anymore. And I'm saying this in jest, but it, it does show like how misdirected some of our, our focus is as to like what is an existential problem here and, and how to solve those. <laughs> the problem is they're gonna hear underwater and they're gonna go, oh, cooling system. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, if we have been indeed eaten by the internet, then I hope this discussion has shown us that perhaps we might eventually be regurgitated <laughs> again. So I want to thank you for joining us for the Futures Podcast Live. I want to say a massive thank you to Space4 for hosting us this evening, to Natasha Natarajan for her organization, and to Nick Goretsky of Houseman Books for their partnership. Uh, Fika and Corinne are currently working on a data center report focused on scarcity and sustainability. They also run a reading group on the environment and technology, which you can join by visiting the Critical Infrastructure Labs website. Their book, Eaten by the Internet, is a available from Meatspace Press and can be purchased from Houseman's Books. If you like what you've heard, you can download the Futures Podcast on your favorite podcasting app or follow us on at Futures Podcast. More episodes, live events, transcripts, and show notes can be found at futurespodcast.net. Please put your hands together and join me in thanking our incredible guests this evening. Thank you.